Alright, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, and welcome back to another episode of IT Pro TV. I'm your host, Don Pizzette, back again with more CompTIA IT Fundamentals. And boy, is this going to be an exciting episode for us, because we are delving into the world of CPUs, Central Processing Units, which are the brains of a computer. So we probably need to have some kind of idea of how they work and what they do. And here to help us learn all of that is Mr. Ronnie Wong. Ronnie, thanks for joining us. Well, Don, thank you for having me on the show as we take a look at the idea of working with our central processing units or CPUs. You'll hear them called so many different things, but that's kind of the terminology that we've settled on. I think when I first started, they just called it a processor and mm -hmm. everybody wasn't sure exactly what that meant. And then they said, oh no, it's a centralized processor. So the terminology has changed a bit of time over the years, but Everybody just calls it a CPU today. Now, what we want to take a look at, of course, is where do we tend to find CPUs? Uh, we'll make sure that we understand that where we will find them today, and it's just about everywhere, but we'll talk about that in, in just a moment, as well as talk about some of the, the different things that we want to know about a CPU as well. And we'll even do a little bit of, of shopping. Now, we'll take a look at some of the labels and what do those numbers really mean, and we'll try and talk about that in a way that will make sense. Uh, so that we have a good grasp of, of some of those concepts that we want to, to begin with. So that's what we'll be taking a look at today. All right, now, Ronnie, in, in the opening sequence there, I said I said computers, right? And in central processing units, CPUs, we find them in computers. But today, darn near everything is a computer. Cell phones, webcams, DVRs, laptops, workstations. I mean, there, there are tons of different types of devices that have CPUs. So what are... What are some of the types that, that we need to be aware of or the places that we'd find these CPUs as far as the, the IT fundamentals exam is concerned? When it comes down to where we tend to find them, like you said, it's just about in every device that we have. Now, Don, you and I kind of grew up in the same era. You, you like the same type of music that I do. Uh, but <laughs> overall, though, you, you, you're a little bit, I'm going to say, you're just a tad bit younger than I am. But I grew up when computers were really not the norm in the house. So in that sense, I didn't really end up working with a computer on, as a regular basis, uh, probably until I got into middle school as, as far as just on a daily basis being able to interact with one. But when I did so, I hate to say it, my initial reaction was it was only good for, well, you know, a few things, but then I started seeing that they were actually good for a ton of different things as well. So where we tend to find, of course, the CPUs are going to be in what we call general purpose computers. That's at least the first encounter uh, that I ended up uh, having with them was a kind of a big box that sat on a desk and on top of that what looked like a big gigantic TV screen with a loud clicky keyboard uh, is where you, you tend to have that. And that keyboard was, I mean, almost a deadly device if you tried to pick one up uh, when you started seeing that. But those particular machines were designed to essentially do everything that a program could do. So they allowed an individual like me at home to be able to work on you know, uh, word processing programs, to be able to run maybe a little math program or a game of something that I wanted to do. So that was kind of my first encounter with, with that. So most of the time, if you grew up with one, probably in your home, there was a computer system that was there and you tended to work with it and you were fine. As you started to spread out into the world a little bit more and maybe even get into you know, uh, uh, another environment, um, for me, uh, this was kind of the next device uh, that I actually came up with, which uh, this is more of a mobile device, okay, uh, is what we also end up finding out too. So not as general purpose, but more specialized in what its purposes are. And of course, even the world of laptops. Now, when we go from workstations to laptops, something like that, we go from something that's tethered in one single location and place and one person being able to work with it to a laptop, which I'm still the only person working with it, but at the same time, it still has the, the, the capabilities that I need to do the processing, but now I can be mobile. I can actually run around and start working with it as well. So both of those end up having processors in them. And then when I started working in IT, I started going into the realm of servers, more high performance. But when we talk about stationary, I mean, they were stationary. They were actually mounted into the floors themselves and you didn't move them or into racks that were actually in the floors. And you couldn't move them and you could actually do a lot more with them, a lot more power and capabilities behind them. But they were really designed to do anything that our business could kind of program it to do and, and do what we needed to. So at least that's my first encounter when I start thinking about the idea of where we tend to find processors. We're in essentially workstations uh, or a home desktop computer, laptops, and the idea of something even smaller like uh, for, for me, like I said, it was more of a I wasn't even a smartphone at that point. It was just a regular phone that was wireless and stuff like that uh, as well. 
uh, but that's what we also tend to see too in laptops as well. All right, so you mentioned a number of different places we might find it, and even just right here on your desk, mm -hmm. right? You've got your cell phone, you've got your laptop. Is it the is it the same type of processor in each? Is it is it just the same one in a different housing, or are they actually yeah. different CPUs? Well, they're they're different CPUs today. The original laptop that I had was just a regular desktop processor. It had the 8088 chip in it, uh, and it was the same one. And then they found out something that even though they they were the same, they weren't designed. They shouldn't have been the same. Okay. So today, though, they actually make them much more efficient as we go into the realm of, well, laptops, for instance, right? Big desktop computers tend to have, of course, not only the CPU in them, but they need some additional cooling. So they add in fans, they add in some different components in there that will essentially help that to cool down. Well, in the laptop, especially in today's laptops, uh, we don't tend to see a lot of fans anymore. So they started making them much more efficient to help out with battery life and also to help keep the heat of the actual device down a bit too. So uh, you'll see that they're not really designed exactly the same. Some of them are designed for more efficiency. Some of them are designed for pure raw power. Some of them are designed just for basic functionality. And that's something that we want to get into today. Most of the time in today's world, we see more specialized devices like I was talking about. The idea of a smartphone is probably on anybody's pocket or on a, a holster of some sort of which people are working with. Tablets are also more popular. Uh, a, a, an iPad tablet today is probably more powerful than the very first computer I bought on my own, not the ones that my parents actually had, uh, but the, the ones that, that I actually you know, ended up buying. They're probably more powerful than any of those that I ever had. So when you start seeing that, uh, you, you start to realize that now they're becoming more specialized. Uh, even in something like a tablet that really is designed to be handheld, designed to be fully functional and mobile, they still have a processor inside, but they're not designed for high power, designed to run applications that are relatively easy for the processor to handle and run as well. And then we can get into even more specialized devices, and today they call it the Internet of Things. Direct devices that attach, uh, you know, and you can have a network address on them where you can directly connect to them and be able to work with those too. So things like thermostats that you might see that are connected uh, to a network, uh, webcams that are out there that are connected to network, your uh, refrigerator today apparently is also another one of these devices uh, and maybe tomorrow Don unless Don has one he might because he's he loves his do you have a toaster that might have uh, an IP address one day not, not, <laughs> not yet <laughs> I, we have the cheapest toaster on the planet but you know I'm always surprised at the amount of internet connected devices that we have now and, and if it's internet connected it's yeah. got to be able to think it's going to need a CPU it's going to have to do that now obviously these CPUs are going to be very different right uh, like you described especially because of things like temperature concerns and power. If you're on a battery-based system, you want to be power efficient. If you're a server mounted in a rack, what do you care? You suck up all the power you can. Right. So we have, we have very differing needs there. Now, we've been talking about it. Let's, let's get a little more, little more tangible right. here. Instead of con concepts, what's an example of like a, an actual physical CPU that we might find in one of these devices? Yeah, that's actually great. So the great thing is we have some examples that we can show you of, of what we can see. So when you start talking about the larger devices like the, the workstation or even inside of, of a laptop or inside of a server, we're normally going to see, well, just hardware that's actually in there. And let me show you an example of what I'm talking about right here. Okay. So when we take a look, uh, I've actually still got this one mounted on a motherboard for us. So I'm holding up the motherboard and then, oh, wrong hand, <laughs> on this side. That is where the central processing unit is going to be. Now, it used to be, Don, that the CPU was almost in the direct center of the board just about, but so that everybody could, of course, get access to it as freely as it can. But here, you see it mounted, and there's actually a special mounting plate that this one has, and it locks it in there. But at one time, you, if you actually did this, it was all kind of you had to push it in there, and it would lock in by friction. Uh, but this is an example of one that you can see fairly uh, decent uh, processor that's in here and it can generate a ton of heat now even though I'm showing you this and if for one reason or another you're watching this and now you're saying oh let me take apart my computer as I see this and you look inside for the first time you're like I don't see anything that looks like this Don okay and that's because these things generate so much heat that normally there's something directly attached to it and let's see if I can grab this thing over here okay so this one Don I'm gonna get you to hold that just for a moment uh, and then let me see I can show you so normally we have this, which has a fan, and also, of course, something that looks like a radiator, which allows for the heat to kind of go up through here, and the fan blows the heat away. And at this point, as Don holds it, 
it normally is going to end up being attached. Let me make sure I'm turning it the right way. It'll be mounted direct. Oops. <laughs> I didn't mean to, for that to happen. That's just me letting go, and I shouldn't have done that. Okay. So we can now mount it, and now with all the power going, it's also cooling it down at the same time. So if you're seeing something like this it, directly underneath that, that's probably where you're going to find the CPU. Okay. So that's where, where we'll tend to have something like this. Now, this is not the only type of cooling device that's out there. And there's, there's no chance that's going to fit inside your cell phone, right? Like not <laughs> easily. Yeah. So that kind of highlights there one of the big differences we have with CPUs is that a, a general purpose CPU needs to be ready to do whatever task we throw at it, and it needs power, like raw <laughs> computing horsepower to be right. able to do as much work as it can, as fast as it can, and it's going to generate a lot of heat. That's not suitable if you've got like a wearable technology. Uh, I have an Apple Watch. Right. If the Apple Watch were to get hot, I'd have to take it off. That defeats the purpose of having it. So they have a different CPU that's optimized for that type of arrangement. So when you open up a computer, odds are you're going to see a big heating system or cooling, cooling system, system is more accurate yeah. uh, inside of it. If you open up a cell phone or a laptop or a, a, a watch, a mm -hmm. webcam, whatever, you likely won't find any fans. Um, well, most laptops, I guess, have fans, but most tablets and things don't. They're designed to optimize heat. So what, what does something like that look like, Ronnie? Well, if depending on how small you want to go, so Don just kind of gave you a reference point, right? He said he has his Apple Watch, which is really tiny. But I can show you an example of one, and here you go, okay? Don, just about everything analogously that we showed you on the motherboard, it also is on this device, too. So right in the center of this, we have the CPU here, too. And then everything else is actually micro- uh, small uh, instead. So this is designed for that lightweight, being able to do the process that it needs to. Not designed for horsepower. So Don, no playing your 3D, uh, you know, game that you're actually going. <laughs> so, but it is designed to be able to handle a few processes and do what it needs to, but not at the super high speeds that you hear people doing this. So Don, I'm going to assume that you haven't overclocked this. Well, uh, you know, <laughs> I haven't. But you mentioned that it's only designed to do a few things. Right. That, that uh, what Ronnie has is what's called a Raspberry Pi Zero. And it is a full computer. It has a processor. It has memory. I think it has uh, 512. 512 megs of RAM. Mm -hmm. It has a video card. It has storage in it. It uses SD card storage. So you could actually install Linux on there and use it as a desktop if you wanted. Very small, small form factor. But it's designed as a project computer, one that you could attach right. to a wearable, a lighting display, something like that to be able to control it. And it's incredibly efficient. Now, Ronnie, when I look at it, I see the large chip right in the middle of it. That's is that the processor? It is the the large darker chip that you see right here on the, when we start taking a look at. It. This is going to be the processor itself. Even little tinier chips that are around to help support whatever else it needs to do. But that's it. And this type of chip is designed differently because this is based on what they call an ARM processor at this point, uh, and that stands for Advanced Risk Machine, if I remember right. Uh, is what it stands for. And so it's a different way of actually doing processing uh, than what our, our more complex uh, type of processor that we showed you on the other mother, motherboard does for us. So high efficiency, not as, you know, uh, working with the power that we actually need here. It, it doesn't take a ton of power to be able to do what we need to. But you tend to find something like this, again, in those smaller project-based devices. Uh, and uh, so you might be able to hook up uh, a string of lights if you want to. I think uh, one of these things like this, though, uh, we, uh, Nate and I, we, we've turned into these uh, connoisseurs of, of a particular cooking uh, <laughs> method, which is called sous vide. Uh, and I don't know if, if Don has tried this uh, at home or not. I've never tried uh, it, but I have heard of it. But Don, Nate's sous vide cooker, he can wirelessly connect and say, here's the temperature and here's the time that you're to start doing the cooking. Mine, I have to go in and actually turn the buttons and do everything else, too. So his probably has a project of something like that that allows him to do the timer and then set the, the temperature and how long it's to cook at that temperature and everything. So it's something like this that can really be helpful. It, he didn't need a full-blown computer to actually just do that for his particular cooking device, but you can imagine something like this would be perfect for that as well. Okay. So when we start talking about this, the, the way that, that this one does processing is kind of a little bit weird. And I want to use an analogy here, Don, okay, uh, for, for us when we start doing it. So this type of processing itself, it takes even some that are relatively, uh, uh, I'm not going to say the most complex math problem that you've ever done, but Don, algebra. I, I, I don't know if you remember uh, your algebra teacher or not, but I do. The one thing my algebra teacher always made me do is, he said, simplify, okay, right? In other words, make sure you break down every step into the simplest process. 
So what actually looked like the easiest answer? He wanted to see what all the steps to that process. And that's what this chip does. It says, look, I don't want to do a bunch of complex stuff. I want to make sure it's simplified. And so even if it takes more steps, it does the simplest process that it can, okay? So that's what I always think about when I think about this type of processing. It says, simplify as many of the instructions as you can, and I can run that through a lot faster. Even as five, I can run that through a lot faster than you if you kind of try and do everything in your head and then show me what the answer actually is here. So this is a really good one for that, that idea of a project-based type of, of device that you have. So it can run and it can do a lot of things for us. You know, and Ronnie, when you mentioned that that was an ARM processor and it stands for Advanced Risk Machine, uh, when he said risk, that's not risk like something yeah. dangerous oh. or challenging. It's RISC, or Reduced Instruction Set Computer. And you might think to yourself, reduced instruction set? Yeah. I don't want a processor that can do less. It's not about doing less. It's about doing things more efficiently, right? Now, the opposite of that would be a, it's CISC. a, a CISC, right, mm -hmm. which would be a complex, complex instruction set. And that's going to be what we see in, in larger right. machines where heat and efficiency is not such a concern. Is that, is that what we normally have like in, in my laptop? Right. So those are kind of the, the different designs of what we tend to see is that. And when you start to get into those complex instruction sets, you can do, uh, again, those super high complex things. And they also allow you to generate more heat, uh, you know, or no, there's more, more can be pushed through them. And they can do a lot more at one particular time as well. So those are kind of the, the big differences. So what we saw on the motherboard example a little bit earlier, that is what you'll tend to see. And these types of processors tend to also break, you know, you know, you can break down and, and start talking about them in different ways as well. But normally that's what we'll see in servers. It's also what we'll see in laptops, what we tend to see in workstations a lot. But in the smaller devices, like the handheld ones that really are about much more efficiency uh, and, and heat, uh, you know, uh, using electricity better, uh, all that, the risk helps because they don't tend to generate a lot more heat. So when you start seeing them inside of your uh, smartphones and start seeing them inside of these lightweight computers, it's so they don't have to add in that additional heating uh, or cooling system uh, to make them do what they need to do. Uh, so you'll probably see that, that too, okay? All right, now, when we start looking at complex instruction set, there's, there's actually a number of different processors. When I go to the store and I go to buy a computer, I've got a lot of choices. A lot of software these days is starting to ask me about my processor when I install it. One of the big questions that you alluded to back in the beginning of the episode is that there are 32-bit and 64-bit processors. Now, we've been talking about general architecture right. so far, so ARM versus uh, you know our regular like Intel or AMD right. infrastructure. And you know, we haven't really talked about right. Intel and AMD. Those are just companies that manufacture CPUs, not necessarily the CPU itself. That's a bit of a difference. So. On the 32-bit and 64-bit side, what does that mean exactly? How, how does that change the way that we talk to the processor? Yeah, this is this is probably one of the more interesting ways to, to try and describe this idea. But when it comes down to it, it's, it's mathematics, okay? So let me show you a diagram and then let me use an analogy. I think that will help us out. So let's take a look at my screen here, okay? If you have a 32-bit processor or a 64-bit processor, what that means is that any one time, it can process this amount of instructions at any one particular point in time, okay? So this is about 4 billion, 4.3 billion. So two to the 32nd power. It doesn't give me that ability to do kind of like the, the raised uh, mark that, that we normally would see here, but that's what it means, okay? So at any one point in time as you're sending it, it can do that much math at one particular point in time, okay? It doesn't matter what, what the time limit is at this point, but that's what it can do. On the other side, when you go to 64-bit, I just rounded the number up because I couldn't type in all the numbers that I remembered here. But it comes down to, well, 1.84 here with about 19 zeros after it. Now, Don, that comes out to be like a billion uh, of these, okay, is what it actually comes out. I mean, billions is what it does, or two, or almost two billion uh, if for every time it does that. So it's a billion billions, right? So if this is 4.3 billion, this is a billion times whatever that is, and that number is, is just, I mean, it's its gigantic, okay? So most people go, well, what does that really mean? Why, why is that important? Well, I like to, because Don, I like to eat, okay? <laughs> so I always make this analogy when I'm talking about this idea, okay? So I relate it to a bite of food. Now, Don, do you like hamburgers? Everybody likes hamburgers. Okay. Everybody likes hamburgers. Or maybe right? maybe veggie burgers. Maybe right? veggie. Yeah, <laughs> if you like veggie, fish burger, chicken burger. But I, I equate it to a bite of food that you can do. So a 32-bit processor, 
it can take a bite of the hamburger and this is how big his bite is, okay? So let's say that, that it normally takes us like 10 bites to eat through a hamburger, but you'd have to do that 10 times to, to be able to, to kind of, you know, eat through whatever, you know, it needed. And it would go through that 10 times. That's how big its bite would be. So, you know, just kind of your, your nibble and your bite here. This bite is so big, Don, this is like eating a cow at one <laughs> time, okay? Or maybe more. I don't even know how you actually equate the number of burgers in a cow, but let's say it actually is equatable to a cow farm uh, is what it can do. So when we start talking about sending information at one time, the 64-bit processor says, I can eat a lot more in one bite. In other words, I can process a lot more information at one time than this guy. And this guy is no slouch. It's still 4.3 billion possibilities at any one particular point in time uh, is what we have when we start sending information. So this is how much it can handle at any one time. Now, Don, you mentioned something else because the, the very fact is you also said about shopping, right? So let me pull up a web page here for just a moment. And I pulled up something like this because it's these numbers here that start to kind of affect us a little bit. So here we have this idea of what this GHZ, right? That stands for gigahertz is what it stands for. And that's uh, if, we, if we go back to some of the, the math that we were doing in previous episodes, we talked about a kilobit and and a kilo, you know, uh, a kilobit, kilobyte, stuff like that. The, the prefix terms still matter. So a kilo is a thousand, mega would be a million, giga would be a billion. So here is saying a billion hertz, which is the, the cycle or the frequency that it can happen. So hertz is about how often something happens per second is what it does. So this particular processor right here is saying 3.7 billion times per second is what this can handle. Now that is how often it can send that amount of information in. So we'll take a look at that in a moment again, but let me go back to my diagram here for a moment. So if we take this number, just theoretically this number, and we go, hey, on the frequency here, okay, instead, what we're actually saying is about three billion times per second. Let me move that up here, okay. It can take this much information, okay, at every single time. So if we were running at three gigahertz, it can do three billion of these at any one second is what it can do. And you even saw where it had a number that said boost or, you know, uh, it, it cycle it can jump up to. It can even, of course, raise. Uh, in other words, it can kind of max out to another uh, a number if it needs to. So this is its operating speed, but if it needs to, it can actually even do more. So that's what we're talking about in terms of the, the idea of frequency. It's not so much that it moves faster, it's that it can actually take in more information. Well, because of how much it can eat at one time, and this is how fast it can eat that information too. So those numbers are, are kind of a little bit confusing if you're only experiencing them for the first time. So that's why I always like to talk about in this term here about how much it can be able to process or eat at one time. That's what those numbers tend to help us to, to be able to understand and uh, do as we start to, to take a look, okay? So between the 32-bit and the 64-bit, as you start seeing it, most of the desktop and server computers today, you'll probably find that they're using the 64-bit processor and you're saying, well, why? And it's because it also has another benefit and feature behind it as well. So when we have a 32-bit processor, it can only access so much of its random access memory, okay? So we talked about that in store in the storage episodes that we've completed here. So the random access memory is the short-term memory. So when we start seeing that, it only has the ability to address 32 bits of that. In other words, about four gigs is what it has the ability to address. And even all that is not gonna be addressed that way. But this one is so big, it can access, well, more than four gigs. And when trying to actually put a real number on that is, is again, a little bit more impossible to do because it's such a big number. We don't tend to, to work in numbers that big and for computers uh, so much. But let's say that it can access more than four gigs and there's really no real limitation that we have except for the hardware. In other words, how much that machine has capacity to put RAM in. So this processor can access even more. And that means it can do more because more programs can be able to send the information that needs to into the processor itself as well. So that's why you'll tend to see 64-bit processors 
uh, more often than you will 32-bit today uh, overall, okay? So uh, when we start talking about that, that's what we tend to see when it comes down to the idea of these processing uh, speeds uh, as well as the idea of the whether it's 32-bit or 64-bit too. All right. Well, Ronnie, I was trying in the background to look up exactly what that number would be called if it was followed by 28 uh, zeros uh -huh. like you were showing. I'm having a hard time even looking that yeah. up and finding it. Uh, I, I believe it, it is a octillion. Um, yeah. So anyhow, it's a huge, huge yeah. number. It's a huge amount of data. And then to consider the fact that we're doing this billions of times per second, it shows how much data we can produce. Now, <laughs> we, uh, we didn't really spend a whole lot of time on it, but when you were on that shopping site, it mm -hmm. also mentioned cores, right. all right? And cores are going to impact the amount of, of things that we can do per per second right. as well. And, and so can you just, I, I know mm -hmm. we it's not technically yeah, on the objectives, fine. but let's spend just a second on, on what those cores are. Yeah, when it comes down to processors today, there, we used to say if we needed multiple processors to do something, we really had to have two chips to do so. But technology changed, it advanced over time, and now they can put multiple cores in to be able to handle that uh, that amount of processing that we need. So instead they took one die and they literally put four processing units on it and that means that they made them smaller but they made them much more efficient. Now you might be wondering like why why would I ever want a multi-core processor? Well this is all about capacity at the same time. So here Don I'm, I'll use another analogy because I've peeled potatoes before. Okay, it is, and you would go, Don's like, are you joking? Always it's always food. Yeah, that's right. It's always food, right? So for, for me, if I have a single core, but I had 10,000 potatoes peeled, it's like one person peeling 10,000 potatoes, okay? Now, I might be the world's fastest potato peeler, okay? But Don, if you got two or three other people with you, and even if you weren't the fastest one in the world, now let's say you're number two, number three, number four, somewhere around there, okay? And all of y'all worked on the same amount of 10,000 potatoes, it doesn't matter how fast I am. I'm not going to beat four other people that are close or almost as good as I'm doing by myself. So it's about the ability for them to divide up workload uh, when we start talking about the number of cores. So when you hear somebody, oh, I want at least a quad core computer, well, they always think it's about the idea of like it's faster, but it's really about how much they're distributing to lessen the workload on any one particular component inside instead. So you you always hear uh, you know you always understand in that fashion it's, it's it's that same idea in that same way to be able to do so. So uh, I could use a car analogy about the number of cylinders in an engine, but I don't know if that would be uh, any less confusing. <laughs> but I, I like potatoes because I like potatoes. So, but if I if I did if I divided it up, Don, just even the simple division, right? Four people, you're only having to do 2,500 of them. The other person's having to do 2,500. You know. So you divide that up, each one is just having to do 2,500. I'm still trying to do 10,000. So unless I've really learned how to do time travel or something, I'm probably not gonna beat uh, those four processors. Even though I'm super fast, it's just not gonna happen. Well, Ronnie, I would definitely stick with the potatoes, right? Because <laughs> five years from now, people will still eat potatoes. Five years from now, not everybody's gonna have cylinders in their engine anymore. So. Yeah, there's no <laughs> doubt. It's just gonna be a coil, yeah. <laughs> then we'll have to talk about batteries I instead. know. All right, well, I think that's a pretty good rundown of uh, the types of CPUs that are out there, the basic operations, and a little definition of that terminology, 32-bit right. versus 64-bit. Uh, did you have any final comments you wanted to mention before we wrap up CPUs? Not really. The, the, the only thing that I kind of recommend that you do is don't get overwhelmed by the term. It's easy when somebody keeps throwing at you numbers and it sounds impressive, but just take a look at it and try and use analogies that help you to understand what, what they're talking about when you start to, to have to learn about this. But if you want to actually take a more advanced step in what we're telling you, make sure you check out our CompTIA uh, uh, A Plus show right here in the IT Pro TV library, and you'll learn more about so many different processors that you'll never believe, uh, and you'll actually see so much more uh, in, in that show. So if you're ready to dive in, you might want to take a look at that show, and that will help you to kind of get a better and firmer uh, you know, uh, foundation on everything that we've gone over today. Excellent, Ronnie. Well, I appreciate you taking that time. I know the viewers do too, and we appreciate you watching. Be sure to stay tuned because we have more CompTIA IT fundamentals coming up. We have a lot more hardware to get through, but then there's the whole rest of the course too. Lots of good information spread throughout it. Definitely check that out. But for now, signing off for IT Pro TV, I'm Don Pizzette. And I'm Ronnie Wong. And we will see you next time. Thank you for watching. 
IT Pro TV.